I even put this? You know I think at least half of the problems in my life could be solved by just being able to have a clean desk. Just one time. Air accessories, spare camera batteries, and like very cute ceramic ghosts, but sir why are you here? I swear this is the real reason why I never seem to get anything done. But as I appear to be in a bitchy mood. Is this a trap? I feel like this is a trap. As we're here, and clearly today's rage levels are high, I think it's the perfect time for a stitching bitch. Oh my god, okay, I'm paying you attention. Jeez. And welcome back to another video. As the title of this video may suggest, Yugala's finding it a little bit difficult at this point in the season to get everything that she needs to get done, done. This ranges from home renovation projects, like finding somewhere for the box of boxes to go, all the way to knitting socks. So I thought that for today's sit down video we could channel some of those anxieties that I am having over not finishing things or being a functioning human into our favourite activity. Bitching. Specifically bitching about books. Or about bookish trends. Or about bookish habits. Or about publishers, you know, being publishers. So I thought that while I continue on this psychedelic pair of scrappy socks, which lovely spouse Harry has handpicked every single scrap for, a saga which you may be familiar with by this point, we could perhaps sit and go through a list of controversial opinions. I reached out to you guys on Instagram and on my Patreon and I asked for some things that you would like to hear me bitch about. And to say that you guys were um forthcoming would be a gross underestimation of your powers because <laughs> I have got me a list. Without any further ado, let us begin. And what were the chances that right as I was beginning to film this video, the trash collectors would come to take away all of the trash opinions? The first controversial opinion that I've got is buying multiple special edition copies is a waste of money people don't even read them. Wow. So first off I am going to say that I think that the person who left this comment is perhaps a little bit too invested in other people's book collections. Which is something that I understand in a way because when you are watching creators on the regular and you are seeing them collecting books and you're seeing the way that they curate them and display them it can be really easy to be like oh I saw them buy this book in a haul three months ago and I still haven't seen them mention it. How come they're doing that? Or even from just just like a more basic FOMO perspective, oh this particular influencer gets a lot of book boxes or is a book rep for lots of companies. But for the most part, in my particular opinion, I think that there is a little bit too much of an over investment in how other people buy and curate their books and what they do with them. And I also think that there needs to be some sort of nuance for the fact that book collecting and book buying can be two incredibly different hobbies. Personally for myself in the last couple of years, my policy for buying special editions of books is I don't buy them unless I have already loved the like original edition of the book. So for example for me that includes authors like Robin Hobb and Pierce Brown where I've really really enjoyed their book in a consistent way and I'm willing to shell out a lot more for a beautiful copy of that book which might yes sit on my shelves entirely unread forever. I have multiple special editions of Assassin's Apprentice. I have only read out of one of those special editions and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And you drop a stitch because you're bitching too hard. I feel like the only thing that's truly controversial about this opinion is that I don't think it's really about the special editions of books. I think it is mostly about what people on the internet are spending their money on. Which is, in my personal opinion, a whole other controversial kettle of fish. Okay, so next up we have got one that I don't necessarily consider myself to be an authority on. It's something that still really, really annoys me. <laughs> and that is third act breakups are pointless. Now I don't read enough romance to know whether this one really comes under the category of yucking somebody else's yum or whether this is one of those where like 
overwhelmingly the opinion of those who read romance is that third act breakups are just useless because we all know that they're coming. For me personally if I know that a book involves a third act breakup I am going to avoid it. That's not necessarily because the book is bad but because it's one of those structure things that just doesn't do it for me. And this is also one of those things where I'm like are third act breakups a trope? Are there a bunch of people out there who really really love them in the same way that they love things like just one bed? Or is this actually the Grey's Anatomy issue? For those of you who I don't know are living under a rock, Grey's Anatomy is a long running series about doctors and surgeons and it's basically a soap opera with some thrilling stuff tacked on to the end, kind of like 911 is. And my overwhelmingly massive issue with Grey's Anatomy is simply that they do romances so very well. They do slow burns, they do accidental hookups that turn into feelings, they do fake dating, they do all of these things wonderfully. But then when they have a couple that are in an established relationship and they're happy, they don't know what to do with them anymore. They don't know how to make the drama in their relationship realistic. The extreme difference here of course being that in Grey's Anatomy third act breakups don't actually mean that people are ever getting back together. Whereas in romance books they almost always are and I guess for me that's the niche that books like Magnolia Parks are kind of filling where there is not even the promise of happy for now at the end of the book but my guess is the reason that that doesn't exist in more romance books is because that's really difficult for publishers to market not because readers don't want it but because publishers don't know how to package it. So yeah I don't entirely know what the solution to this one is but I will definitely agree that for me third act breakups are pointless and mostly steer me away from books if I know that they're there. Alright so the next controversial opinion up here actually matches one that I got much later on when I called for questions and that was what is the latest piece of controversy which actually got to you? Which goes with this comment which just says the will of the many cover redesign. So for those of you who haven't been hanging out on bookstagram where a lot of cover announcements tend to happen you may have missed this. The will of the many by James Islington has been a massive release. I think it came out at the end of last year. Either way I have it in hardback and the original hardback looks like this. It's very classic and I don't mean that in the fact that it has like Corinthian columns on it. I mean it's very cleanly classic. It's a very sleek book design which in itself makes it very different from a lot of the other book designs that we see coming out for high epic fantasy especially when they're written by a male author. So it had that going for it in and of itself. But some of the other opinions that I've seen about this original cover are that it also made it more accessible for people who were a little bit more intimidated by high or epic fantasy but really really wanted to read it and also for readers who were not cisgendered men. Lots of people who fall out of that category which can I just say is a large percentage of the fantasy reading population really really love this cover because it doesn't feel like a dude bro book. So for all of those reasons this cover is beloved amongst the fans. Then the publisher announced that they would be bringing out a special edition copy of this book which looks like this. We'll get to the actual cover itself in a second but the special edition features of this book were that it was a new dust jacket, it was I think going to have sprayed edges, I think that was a run of them that was going to be signed but all of those things are kind of by the by because none of them make this a special edition. There was not going to be foiling under the dust jacket, there wasn't going to be a reversible dust jacket, there wasn't going to be custom end papers. This book was essentially going to be the exact same book repackaged. That in and of itself is extremely annoying from the perspective that this is a brand new book which has just come out. It is only in hardback right now. It's not yet available in paperback. So bringing out a special edition of it at this point feels very like a massive money grab. However, the publisher then explained off of the back of that that this was then going to be the only version of this cover which would be available going forward. Which meant not only have they ignored all of the feedback about the original covers and just been like eh, but they then also said if you want to have a matching set you have to buy this special edition in order to do that because the following books in these editions won't match. There are not going to be any more covers that match this original cover from the publisher and that 
is the thing that really kind of put the death knell in this book for a lot of people. There are hundreds hundreds of comments on the post from this publisher on their Instagram which is like this is gross, it's money grabbing, it's unfair when there was nothing wrong with the original covers, it's not like there was anything controversial about them or they had made a mistake on them. It's simply that they see an opportunity to cash in with a larger audience, the audience that they've already got plus this audience that hasn't been buying this book and they have rejected it to suit. Tell me that publishers don't care about readers without telling me that publishers don't care about readers. And all of all of all of that aside, this cover looks looks like sci-fi. It looks like sci-fi and it portrays the book in a way that the book doesn't actually reflect. This doesn't give any kind of hint to the type of story that you're going to find inside it. Having read The Will of the Many, yes, the will, which is the magic system in this series, is of course very, very important to the plot. You could say it's integral to the plot. But it's also not the only plot. This makes it look like the will is the only thing that's important in these books and that the entire book centres around that and it's not. It's a very character focused, very character driven story. Do I think that us complaining is necessarily going to change their behaviour? No. But is it going to stop me doing it? Also no. Okay, let's get back to the stitching part of the bitch. <laughs> Speeding up audiobooks is just trying to get higher numbers. You aren't actually understanding the whole book and you forget them as soon as you finish them. Well, damn Daphne, who peed in your tea? So without covering ground that we have already touched on when it comes to audiobooks and the accessibility of audiobooks, I am somebody who up until mm, two years ago maybe did not speed up audiobooks at all. I found that when I sped up audiobooks, I was struggling a little bit to pay attention. Since then, however, I have learned a lot more about myself and also about my ADHD. And I have discovered that for me, the issue with me not speeding up audiobooks was simply that I was expecting audiobooks to be the only noise in the room. When I'm doing anything else, literally anything else, when I am reading physically with my eyeballs, when I am crafting, when I am cooking, I have at all times at least two sources of noise on in the background always. What I discovered was if I'm listening to an audiobook I also need to have another source of noise on in the background. I need to have like an ambient room on in the background turned up loud enough that I can actually process the sound. But during the course of me only being able to listen to audiobooks at one time speed I was not sitting there looking at other people being like I don't think that you're taking in the information that you're listening to because you've sped it up. I was in fact sitting there going you are a wizard please teach me your ways and I did express a bunch of different times on my channel that I just didn't understand how people could do that because I hadn't worked out the way that it worked for my brain. Now that I have worked out the way that it worked for my brain and it is less tangled than this yarn now is, I am now a person who listens to most audiobooks on at least two times speed. That is not because I am trying to race through the story to get more numbers on like my Goodreads challenge for the year and it is not because I'm trying to get more books together so I can talk about them in a wrap up. It is only because I have discovered that the speed for me doesn't really matter as long as I can still understand what the narrator is saying and so why would I listen to a 43 hour audiobook on single speed when I can get the same information and the same listening experience on double speed and possibly yes read another book in the time that I would have been reading that one. I think that comments like this predominantly do come from people who only listen to audiobooks on 1 or 1.5 speed and they will only speed up a narrator if they are one of those ones who are speaking so slowly that you think that they are getting paid by the second that they sit in the booth. And I also think that it has come from this weird sort of attitude that a very small subset of people seem to have when it comes to watching booktubers read books. Taking away from the fact that some people do booktube as their full-time job and so all of their job relies on them reading books and on telling you about books and that you wouldn't be able to consume the content that you love to consume from most of those booktubers if they did not read as many books as they read. Taking into account just the people on booktube that do this as a hobby, that is, for the most part, 
their primary hobby. My thing has always been books. I have always read a vast amount of books. And so if you are somebody who only does this one thing as their biggest primary hobby, of course you're going to do more of it than people who only dabble in it. And so yeah, there is a section of the population that reads like less than four books in a year and is perfectly content with that. But those people are not the people who are on booktube. Also, on just a complete side note, this is one of those opinions that just kind of goes goes back to my whole like stay in your lane eyes on your own paper thing. My book reading and the way that I consume books it doesn't impact you at all in any way. If you watch my content it means you potentially get more content the more books that I read but apart from that it literally does not impact you at all and in the same way that most of us sensible normal people would not walk down the street look in other people's windows and criticize what they have in their house or how they decorate it or what they are doing with it. You shouldn't look at how other people are consuming books and criticize how they are consuming books and how they choose to do that and why they do that because it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect us in the slightest. Let it go. I feel like I need to put the stabby things down. You know what guys we are going great guns on this foot. Being able to bitch whilst also stitching at the same time really appeals to my brain. Has there been a few drop stitches? Maybe. Maybe. But have we fixed them and now you can't see them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something very deep and profound in there about making mistakes and knowing they're not the end of the world but I can't particularly reach for it right now because my brain is still in the bitching. So let's go to the next controversial opinion. Oh! <laughs> Which is, and I love the way that this one is phrased, you don't read what you haul. Ouch. Okay, let's talk about this from a personal point of view because I think this one was kind of just a little bit personal. We know that over the past two years I've been running my Bingo Board From Hell project which is simply for me to address what I consider to be the issues with my reading. And one of those issues was indeed the fact that I felt like I was buying a lot of books but I wasn't necessarily getting to all of the books in that year or even in the subsequent year which was then creating two problems on my shelves one being rainy day books which were books that I was just like keeping for the perfect time and TBR veterans which are simply books that have been on my shelf for a really long time but I'm still interested in reading. Two years on are both of those things still issues on my shelves? Yes or we would not have the new vlog series which is my TBR veterans series. However am I actively addressing those concerns with my own reading? Also yes or we wouldn't have the 60% diaries. When it comes to my personal own reading I think that I've made a ton of progress. I tend to be a person who sees a book, reads the blurb, immediately assimilates the blurb into their brain and then wants to own the book if I am interested in it. I've always been wired that way and I don't inherently think that that's a bad thing. I don't inherently think that buying something because it makes you happy in that moment is a bad thing. Yes there is an entire discussion to be had about consumerism and environmentalism and not buying things that we don't immediately need. There's a whole discussion to be had about that. However, I still maintain it that while we are holding to those values, we also need to make ourselves happy. We also need to actually live. When it becomes an issue is when you've created a problem for yourself which you then feel like you need to solve. For example, I am running out of space in my library. Or if you are somebody who likes to buy books but also likes to keep a smaller TBR, there's then the whole like, I have more TBR books than I can read in X amount of time, that's stressing me out. Or simply from the point of view of I don't have that much disposable income to spend on books right now. And all of these things were different tiny aspects of the reason that I decided to address my particular book buying habits. Ultimately I'm addressing my book buying for me and my mental health and not anybody else because I don't think that my book buying was particularly egregious but I do want to kind of pip it at the post before it does become harmful or something else to me. Okay so I'm gonna do one more long ranty one but just before I do I have had a little look down my list and there are a couple of other opinions that I can fly through really really quickly so I'm going to do that now. Cozy is overused. This 110% came from one of my patrons who was trying to trigger me with this comment. However I do think that there are a bunch of other terms that are overused in the book world. It just so happens that Cozy has encroached on my particular area. Cozy Mysteries and cozy romances have always existed. They have always been out there. They've always been a subgenre of all of these things. It's just that because publishers have realized that 
cozy right now is a buzzword it's getting slapped on absolutely everything which is exactly what happens with other buzzwords so i have deep confidence that eventually cozy will go to its final resting place and we will return to some kind of sanity booktuber merch is tacky <laughs> Okay, I mean, go off if you think so, don't buy it. But I think this is less like booktuber merch is tacky and more like influencer merch is tacky, which is a mindset that I just can't really get behind because as previously discussed, influencers of any kind for the most part are providing you with free top quality content that a lot of them spend not just their actual working time doing but much more working time than a lot of people spend in like a nine to five job bringing to you and while i don't consider myself to be an influencer in any way there is a subset of people who come to my channel and enjoy my content who don't read any of the books that i read at all and in fact some people actually hate the books that I read but they're there because they enjoy the environment that's created on my channel they enjoy the fact that opinions are welcomed here that queerness is welcomed here they enjoy the fact that I'm Scottish and so for some people they're not particularly interested in the actual product that I'm discussing they are more interested in just hanging around with me for a little while and I think those are the kinds of people who would quite like you know like a uh, frequently said saying from my channel on a bookmark or something like that and I don't think there's really anything wrong with that from the point of view of a creator trying to support themselves by selling things that people want or from the point of view of people who are fans of a person enjoying the things that they are a fan of because realistically that's all that it is. I personally have recently become absolutely obsessed with Emily D Baker who is a LawTube YouTuber and I would love, love some of her merchandise because it's cool and I love her sayings and I love her and she's very my vibe and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that just comes under the category of like indulging yourself in things that you enjoy in an immersive way and then last on my rapid fire one before i do one slightly longer one is bookstagram is really unfriendly and hard to live up to i think these are two totally different concepts to me to the places that i have personally hung out on bookstagram i haven't found it to be unfriendly at all there's a chance that that's because what I do is watch a lot of people's stories and so I react to things that they're having in real time and the conversations that I have are less like on their grid and on their posts and also in the fact that I don't really consider myself to be a bookstagrammer I definitely post like pretty pictures over there a lot of them are books but I don't necessarily put a huge stock in my grid i share like baking and knitting and dogs and all other kinds of stuff on my stories so i think there's a subset of every community that you can consider to be unfriendly and maybe like pointed and unwelcoming but there will always be the exact opposite is that because fundamentally people are actually nice a lot of the time i find on the other hand the idea that it is hard to live up to bookstagram i totally understand that i wish that i was a person who could put together beautiful flat lays i wish that i was a person who had the ability to absolutely pull everything off their shelves to make beautiful aesthetic pictures and then actually reliably put all of it back again and not just leave it lying on the floor or on my desk as we've previously covered in this video but I'm not that person so I just have got to the point in my life and I don't know if it's a mid-30s thing uh, but I've got to the point in my life where I'm like it's okay to like things and to aspire to be like things that you're never going to do. I would love to if I had the ability to be that beautiful flat lay photographer bookstagram person but you know what I'm not and so I'm just gonna enjoy that from afar and hope that they're having a great time and really enjoy consuming their stuff and I'm not gonna worry too much about the fact that I don't have the ability to make that stuff myself okay so the last one because I feel like this video is probably going to be on the long side when I really didn't expect it to be I really expected it to be kind of like an off the cuff sit down and chill situation for my last big ranty bitchy controversial opinion a book review is more than just saying I liked this or I liked that 
that's not reviewing books. Oh, my sweet summer child. <laughs> so I am coming at this from the point of view of somebody who was a literature student. That is what my degree is in. I studied literature, I studied the classics with a specialism in the 19th century novel and in romantic poetry. So I know what it is to fully provide an academic review of a book and that is not what booktube is. Yes, absolutely there are people out there who have carried on their academic style into their book reviews. There are definitely book reviewers out there who will serve you that kind of opinion. There are book reviewers out there who you can reliably go to for things like classics or literary fiction and they will give you the same kind of like comparison and analysis and deep deep insight into that book as if they were writing an academic paper which was going to be judged as if they were actually having to summarize that as a job but predominantly that is not what booktube is nor is i think what it should be really used for booktube is a community of people who are reading books and saying i really love this and these are the reasons why or i really didn't like this and these are the reasons why and yes in there there is a certain amount of pointing out things which are problematic or which are done poorly or which you personally believe should have been done in another way and to that end I think that booktubers especially people who read books especially are held to a much higher standard than any other community on the internet when you look at the gaming community or the beauty community etc etc booktubers because of what they consume are held to a much higher standard in terms of reading diversely pointing out things which are not okay not supporting authors who have turned out to be problematic and don't get it twisted i'm not sitting here saying that we should continue to support authors who are problematic but i'm saying there's a difference between actively supporting those authors and just not being aware of it but being expected to be aware of it because you are a booktuber or in the book community so therefore you must know everything. I have quite a few times on my channel shown a book that I'm in good faith being like I've heard this is great and then I've had a few people be like hmm you might want to look into that author's backstory before you actually decide to read this book or support them and that has helped to influence my decision. Personally for me in my reviews I think that I do a really good job of saying I absolutely love these things oh my god these are the things that I really love in books so it did all of these things these are new things that I found that this book did that I really really love and here's a bunch of things that I don't think that were done as well or that I really didn't like or that I found problematic and I think I walk a really fair line of doing both of those things but there are also just some books that I'm unable to be objective on some books that I have loved so much that all I can do is gush about them and being like oh my god this character and this thing happened and oh Oh, the place is character in this like the house was amazing things that I'm just like so enthusiastic about that I'm maybe not as articulate as I am about a book that was mid what booktube really is is a community of really enthusiastic people who love one thing and want to tell you about the thing that they love and some of the things that they didn't love and the best way to use it is to find people who either have exactly the same tastes as you or similar so that you can trust their recommendations or conversely to find people who have completely opposing opinions to you and hang around for their personality because they're great but pick up all of the books that they hated because I do both of those on booktube and personally for me my booktube feed is really successful for me. We're just trying our best to please you and ourselves at the same time and to make content that we're proud of while also not making ourselves sad about our favourite hobby in the world. Okay, well, that was certainly more ranty than I ever expected it to be. I suppose if I ask for extremely spicy opinions, I can at least be absolutely sure that you guys are going to come through for me. In terms of sock knitting, we did all of this part while we were chatting. Uh, would I have got more done had I not been bitching at the same time? Yes, but was it fun anyway? Absolutely. Will I potentially do this again? yeah probably <laughs> so if you have made it this far through the video then please leave me your most aggressive your most snide smiley face down in the comments below the one you want to send people when you want to say i really don't like you right now or even better the one that you send people when you're like i knew i was right i'm glad that you finally come to see that and of course please leave me 
your most controversial book opinion down below. I mean, I obviously want to hear whether you agree with me or not because opinions do live here. Whether I agree with yours or whether you agree with mine, I want to hear it. So tell me what you think about the things that I've said today down below, but also tell me about your favourite controversial bookish opinion. If you are new to my channel and you would like more stitches and bitches in the future then please hit that subscribe button and if you are a regular viewer whose skin has been cleared, whose crops have been watered by all of this bitching then please hit that thumbs up because you really do help my channel and I will speak to you guys really soon. Bye!